Hello, this is Phenomenology. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video we'll be taking a look at the first section of Emmanuel Levinas's text, Totality and Infinity. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, so let's sort of quickly start. What we've been taking a look at in our video series and in the lectures is we've looked at Edmund Husserl's text, um, uh, pure phenomenology and a pheno towards a phenomenological philosophy, his Ideas One book. Um, and in there we saw Edmund Husserl laying out some of the critical elements of the phenomenological method. Um, and then we've also taken a look to the first part of Martin Heidegger's um, text, Being in Time. In particular, we've looked at part one, division one, um, in which <clears throat> Heidegger articulates um, a fundamental problem that he think is, thinks is missing in philosophy, and that's the problem of being. And he employs this phenomenological method, or a variation of it, in order to explicate uh, and to describe um, a completely different philosophical conception about our living in the world. And we looked at uh, Heidegger's conceptions. And today what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be starting um, our video series on Emmanuel Levinas, who is a student of Husserl and Heidegger. We're going to be looking at his really magnum opus, one of his key and most important texts, of his to uh, which is Totality and Infinity. Um, and I should say that we're only going to be looking at Totality and Infinity for three sessions, so we're not going to get too far into it. But I think you're going to find that it's an extremely rich text. Um, finally, just a sort of word in terms of the form of the lecture today. Um, typically, I've been using these um, Prezi presentations in order to go through text. Um, today, what we're going to do is I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to start off with the Prezi presentation today, sort of going over a little bit of um, Levinas' biography, a little bit about the, phil um, the general philosophical ideas, and then we're going to dive into the text itself, and we're going to, uh, and I've highlighted sections of the text that I want to walk through and talk about with you. And so that's sort of what we're going on today. So we're going to be following the text very, very closely. It's similar if you've watched any of the other video lectures um, that I've done on Aristotle's metaphysics. Um, and part of that's because one thing you're going to see is that um, Levinas is a beautiful writer, actually. That's one of the things that I'm attracted to in his philosophy. I'm also attracted to it um, because he tries to very, take seriously the problem of the other. So let's just jump into it um, and let's see how far we can go, get through. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm planning that this video will really cover the preface to Totality Infinity as well as Section 1A, um, the same and the other. So welcome back. So the other, this is a critical concept here, um, and we're going to see that um, really Levinas's essay is about the question of what it means to be in a relationship with an other, except Levinas is going to take the other very, very serious philosophically, um, and here it's important to, to see that he's going to be juxtaposing with um, sort of traditional philosophy with what he does here, which is a phenomenology, a philosophy of exteriority. We often make the distinction between the interior and the exterior. Um, most of philosophy seeks to turn every, the world and all the, the, the variety of things we experience into something that's comprehensible in terms of our own interior knowledge and experience. Uh, but that doesn't take the problem that others are really outside of us. They're other than us. And so what um, Levinas wants to do here is he wants to, he wants to articulate a philosophy, a phenomenological philosophy, that takes exteriority as its primary consideration. Um, so it's going to be very interesting and provocative, and I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, so for instance, up to now we've been taking, we've, when we've looked at Husserl, we saw that phenomenology was an articulation of a method for exploring consciousness um, and the fundamental structures indicative and constitutive of consciousness, as well as eidetics, and eidetics here refers to the idea of essences and the being of essences, and here we spoke a lot about mathematics um, and Husserl's, or we, we saw how Husserl evaluates what's happening mathematically in terms of an eidetic analysis of consciousness. And of course, ontology became a theme that sort of erupts out of Husserl's work. 
Oh, in Rusro, we also saw that intentionality in the horizons of intentional modes and modifications is a central part of what the phenomenal phenomenologist is up to. Uh, that is, looking at the directedness of consciousness and understanding the horizons and the modes that accompany intentionality. For instance, we also saw in Husserl the philosophical epoch, um, as well as his description of other phenomenological reductions. Um, and we talked about phenomenological residuums and a whole range of things with Husserl. Um, of course, this is not an exhaustive sort of list of Husserl or even a, a, a proper summation of Husserl's philosophy, but these are some of the key things that we saw in Husserl uh, that you're going to see being linked up in our discussion today with Levinas. Um, Heidegger, for instance, we saw a turn towards the priority of the question of being, the Seinsfrage. Uh, remember, Husserl, all, I'm sorry, Heidegger also argued for what he called the destruction of Western metaphysics. And that is because he thought since the question of being had been so uh, buried or covered over by a, a whole range of historical philosophical conceptualizations that really to get at the heart of um, of being ontology we had to give up metaphysics and sort of uh, destroy it as it were um, and we're going to see today that Levinas is going to argue for rather the priority of metaphysics but he has a very particular thing when he's talking about metaphysics, and we're going to talk about that today. And we also saw with Heidegger that the being of Dasein is given first, and most importantly, in an average, everyday, ordinary um, form of existence. Um, and so, in a certain way, we're going to see that Levinas takes uh, account of that, and really follows on the one hand within that tradition, but we're also going to see that um, he attacks Heidegger very rigorous, vigorously, um, over what he calls Heidegger's um, tendency to reduce the other, the exterior, into something which is the same, comprehensible in terms of being. Um, so he's going he's gonna to have a strong criticism of Heidegger. We're not going to get too much of that today, though we will talk a little bit about it. Uh, remember here from Heidegger, we did talk about being in the world, and the idea there is that Dasein is first and foremost of being in the world, and in, in the parts of being in time that we looked at, we looked at how Heidegger understands being in, he understands the world, and who is in the world. Uh, and we also talk about discourse and idle talk, and I'm raising that, and, I, and I, we went over that, because we're going to see that Levinas provides a very important place for the idea of discourse and what it means to have a communication, communion with other with other people who are other than us. Um, and this is gonna become a very central part of Levinas' sort of organization. Um, so there's there's a way in which you might say that we'll see that Levinas follows really within this tradition that you have Husserl and Heidegger, but he also deviates and disagrees with both of them in a really provocative and interesting sense. Uh, so that's a little bit of what we've looked at. Of course, there's a lot more in particular, right? We've been There's hours and hours of lectures we've been doing, um, but uh, those are some of the key things I want you to be thinking about as you're reading uh, Totality and Infinity and also as you're... Um, 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 as you're thinking through these problems of exteriority. Now, I thought it was important to mention what some of the key phenomenological thinkers are within the tradition. Um, of course, Edmund Husserl and Heidegger. I put Levinas here next, um, really because Levinas studied with both of the, both Husserl and Heidegger. Um, Hannah Arendt is another important um, phenomenological philosopher who focuses on um, a phenomenology of politics, and she has a vigorous defense of uh, democracy, um, for instance. And so, Hannah Arendt's a very sort of interesting figure as well. Um, um, Jean-Paul Sartre, who is really one of the most famous existentialist philosophers, and I think we could call him a phenomenologist as well, um, at least to a certain degree. Um, he is very, very important. And unfortunately, we just didn't have time in our series to, to talk about him. I posted other video lectures online. You can take a look at those on Sartre, uh, but really Sartre demands his own course. Uh, of discussion. Also, another some of the other philosophers here, Simone de Beauvoir, um, who uh, has a great book called The Second Sex, which is worth looking at, especially for anyone who's interested 
uh, in questions of, for instance, gender identity, you could take a look at Simone de Beauvoir's work. Um, Maurice uh, Merleau-Ponty, um, he's a great philosopher, um, and he really focuses on the role, the phenomenology of the body. Um, and then I put Derrida in here. Derrida is known for deconstruction and really a philosophy of language. Um, but I put it in here because Derrida is in many ways um, a Heideggerian um, and employs a sort of phenomenological method, I suppose. I, I hesitate to call Derrida a phenomenologist in the same way I would call Heidegger or Husserl a phenomenologist, but he definitely flows within this basic tradition. And so any of these thinkers are, are ripe for study and, and worthy of your attention. And so, but I, because our video series is coming to a close, we're not going to be getting to all these different thinkers, but I do want to point and highlight some of these thinkers out for you. Um, but of course, we're going to be jumping into Levinas here and jump, riding, jump right into it. Well, here's a picture of the good old boy himself, um, and I don't mean that rudely. Um, this is Emmanuel Levinas. He was, uh, let me go over his biography a little bit with you. There's a lot to his biography, of course, and I'm not going to go through it too exhaustively here. Um, he was born in 1906 and died in 1995. Um, he was born in Kosno, Russia, uh, but in 1914 his family actually immigrated to the Ukraine uh, because of World War I. Um, and in 1923 he, he moved to France and studied in Strasbourg, um, France. Um, and then in between 1928 and 29 he moved to Germany where he studied at Freiburg with Husserl and, and Heidegger and attended Heidegger's lectures there and this is remember the 20 1928 to 1929 this is the high point um of who of heidegger's career i would argue it's the early part of his career uh, but this is at the very center of his most exciting intellectual activity that we see in being in time um, and so levinas is being is studying with the best uh, and of course the two philosophers that we've paid most of our attention to during this time period um, Levinas, um, of course, Levinas lived in France, and he's really a French philosopher, uh, despite having come from originally from Russia, um, and having lived in the Ukraine. Um, he would continue to live in France his life. In fact, he eventually became a citizen of France and actually fought in World War II um, for the French um, before being captured himself. Um, now, before the, the, the Second World War breaks out, in 1931, Levinas translates Husserl's Cartesian Meditations into French, uh, which it would be interesting. We're going to be talking about, we see Descartes come up very early on in Totality and Infinity, and we're going to see that Descartes' conception of infinity plays a really central role uh, for thinking about these problems um, for Levinas. Um, and so Husserl's own thinking of the Cartesian Meditations is instructive here. We haven't had a chance in our, in our series to look at the Cartesian Meditations, uh, but for those of you who are very serious about phenomenology, this is must, uh, must reading, if you will. Um, now, in 1934, Levinas publishes Reflections on the Philosophy of Hitlerism. Um, so in 34, um, Levinas is already recognizing that there's a significant and bizarre sort of uh, movement uh, that's following a sort of fascist movement that we see arising with Hitler. And so I'll be honest with you, I haven't read that text, Reflections on the Philosophy of Hitlerism, but it shows that um, even before the war really breaks out in full bore, um, uh, Levinas is concerned with the social relation uh, that, that Nazism presents and the social problems that it signifies potentially, or definitely does actually. Uh, in 1935, he publishes On Escape, which is one of his first original works that were published. In 39, he actually enlisted into the French officer corps, um, and he was actually a French officer. Now, it's also important here, I haven't mentioned in the biography here, that uh, he's also Jewish, and he's, um, and he's very, very interested, he's very committed um, to, to the theology of Judaism. And to the tell and to the and he offers a number of Talmudic commentaries um, that he's very very well known for, um, and so you could say in in Levinasian scholarship there's sort of two sides to it. There's the philosopher Levinas, and then there's the if you will uh, the theologian Levinas, who are the Talmudic comment. Uh, 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 the the yeah I guess the Talmudic theology is really what he's doing. 
Uh, and so there's sort of two different strains. There's a religious side to uh, Levinas, and then there's also a secular philosophical side. Um, as far as I understand, Levinas saw those as two separate sorts of things. And in fact, he never his when he would publish something in philosophy, he would use one publisher. And when he published something um, in Jewish thought, he would publish it. Um, Jewish religious thought, he would publish it with a different publisher. So he kept those two sides of his intellectual life separate. And I think that's because he sees a, a, an important distinction. In fact, in Totality and Infinity, we'll see that Levinas even comments on what the relationship between a theological conception and a philosophical conception of exteriority, how they differ, um, and what the other means in each context. And so uh, I'm mainly focusing, of course, on the philosophy and the sort of secular side, if you would, see, if you could say that. There is debate about whether or not we can really disentangle Levinas's religiousness from his philosophy here. And at a core level, I don't think you can, um, but that's because at a core level, he's one person. Um, but I think that intellectually, we can abstractly recognize sort of difference between them. Um, and also, we should be open to thinking, um, a rec recognizing perhaps some of the insights uh, that uh, philosophers can learn by looking at, for instance, um, the other side of the fence, as it were, in terms of looking at different theologians and different uh, thoughts outside of the sort of main thrust of secular philosophy in the 20th century. I mean, I sort of went on and on there, sorry. Um, now, out in 1940, he was actually captured by the Nazis. Now, because he was Jewish, uh, but you're probably wondering, why, why wasn't he killed in the Holocaust if he was captured by the Nazis? Well, the Nazis in the Second World War did not, for the most part, execute um, the officers of foreign uh, militaries. Uh, they did, in fact, execute um, a Jewish enlisted um, um, soldiers. So if you're just an enlisted um, an enlisted soldier and you were Jewish and the Nazis captured you, you probably would have been sent to a concentration camp uh, or to a death camp. Uh, but this wasn't the case for the officers. Um, now, unlike because he was Jewish, unlike the other French officers who were non-Jewish, um, he was actually sent to a work camp where many people did die. But he was sent to a work camp and forced to work in the Black Forest. Um, so... Uh, during this time period, his extended Lithuanian family was murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. It's really quite tragic. Uh, with great fortune um, and with great courage by others, his wife and daughter um, were, were survived because they were hidden in a convent. Um, so this is sort of an important point um, in his life. And In fact, as far as I've read and understand, Levinas was extremely indebted I mean, had a great respect for the Catholic Church. Um, in fact, even, I believe, in the 90s, he actually met with Pope John Paul II, who was also a phenomenologist. We haven't talked about that. Um, I think I may have mentioned it once before, but uh, the Pope John Paul II was a phenomenologist, and he read Levinas' work, and they actually had a meeting together. And I believe it was during that meeting that Levinas thanked, formally thanked, uh, the Catholic Church for their work in saving not just uh, his family but others. Um, his life wasn't. His life did, have, of course, have tragedy, obviously, and in many ways, Levinas's work um, takes very, very seriously um, the problems that seem to be at the core of what happened during the Holocaust. And some have even said uh, or remarked and commented that Levinas's philosophy is a sort of survivor's philosophy. And is in, in really to understand his philosophy and, and the importance that he places on the ethics of the other um, is uh, a reaction, a response, a learning from his, his the most tragic experience of the 20th century, uh, or one of them, if not the most. Um, the genocide of the Jewish people, um, among others. Um, so Levinas' sort of experience in the Second World War really shapes Levinas in a major way, I think. Um, in 1947, he actually becomes the director of the École Normale um, Israelite Orientale in Paris, which I believe is a school, a private school, um, a private Jewish school, um, in Paris, and he was the director there. He was actually an administrator, uh, but during the nights, and he would continue to write. So 
He was never, he would eventually offer a number of lectures at the University of Paris and Sorbonne, uh, but he was never a, a formal university professor, um, which is nice, I think. I, I think that his experience, at, he was obviously a, high, a brilliant intellectual um, and an important intellectual, uh, but it shows that philosophy um, can exist and does exist all over the places. Um, and I think there's something important there to think about um, to rupture our sense that philosophy is just a sort of dry subject that takes place in the universities. Um, in 1950, and by the way, I apologize, I don't speak French, so I know I totally butchered that name in French, so my apologies. Um, and let's see, in 57, he delivers uh, his, Talmud, his Talmudic readings, his commentaries um, and on the Talmud, and um, it's during this... It's and I just I put that in here because it's during this time period which you can see he's he's really working through a lot of interesting stuff and he has sort of a religious side and a philosophical side. Now in 1961, uh, Totality and Infinity, Infinity was published. This is essentially is is his doctorate, um, and this is it's an essay on exteriority, and this is what we take a look at here in a minute. In 72, he publishes Humanism and the Other. Uh, in 73, he was a lecturer at the Sorbonne. And there's a lot of other things that happened and took place, including a lot of other important texts that he wrote. I haven't included them just because to, I want to keep this video moving, um, which you're probably wondering why it's taking me so long. <laughs> uh, in 1995, tragically or sadly, he dies in Paris on December 25th. Um, and I think in many ways, um, Levinas's work has sparked a whole range of important questions. Um, and I think that we're going to see that there's an interesting resonance here, ultimately, with feminist philosophy that's worth thinking about. Um, and I think in many ways, we're still at the early point of understanding the contribution philosophically that Emmanuel Levinas offers. Um, I also should offer just a sort of word of caution, which is namely, I'm not a Levinasian scholar. Um, so. Um, I encourage you to read this on your own. I encourage you to also read other person's commentaries. A great person who write, has written a lot on Emmanuel Levinas is Simon Critchley. Uh, take a look at his work, his book, his recently published book on Levinas uh, to really get an even a much better and a greater depth of understanding regarding Levinas' philosophy uh, than what I can give us today and here. Uh, but it's really powerful stuff, and I'll be honest with you, one of the reasons I chose to, to really focus on Totality and Infinity for this video is, I remember when I first was going through and learning and reading Levinas, I remember riding the subway in New York, and just being so enthralled, I couldn't put the book down that I missed my subway stop, um, and it's beautifully written, it's provocative, um, there's also parts where it's opaque and difficult, uh, but I think it's a very rewarding text. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it, and I'm really hoping that you will as well. Um, okay, so what are some of those key philosophical ideas that we're going to see when we look at um, totality and infinity? Oops, I sort of, all right. Um, some of the things we're going to see, let me go here. So, pardon me. Okay, the first sorts of things I want you to think about when we talk about Levinas is the idea that, number one, um, there's always a discussion here about what's first philosophy. What's the most prior uh, philosophical point? Where do we start in philosophy? Um, historically, for instance, in Plato and Aristotle, first philosophy is conceived of as metaphysics. Um, and then we see much later with Descartes and really the rise of modern philosophy, we see that epistemology, or the question of knowledge, becomes first philosophy. Well, with Levinas, we see something really quite radical, which is the idea that ethics becomes first philosophy. Now, we're going to see here that ethics for Levinas is not to be understood as some sort of systematic algorithm for right action, right? Ethics is not, uh, he's not, he's not interested in giving an ethics where um, we lay out a principle, like the principle of utility or the categorical imperative. Uh, or a virtue ethics sort of theory. It's not that we lay out a theoretical groundwork and then we apply that to our lives and we apply it to situations. So it's not an ethics in the traditional sense, which is why, of course, um, it can be an ethics as first philosophy. We're going to see that for um, Heidegger, I'm not for Heidegger, for Levinas, and, and, Der and Derrida makes this comment, is that ethics concerns 
the conditions of possibility for our interest in living a good life and for living a good life. So ethics becomes about the conditions for the possibility of the good life. And so eth and he's going to argue that this is our first point because ultimately um, ethics is about our relationship with the other, our relationship to that which is exterior to us. Um, and in particular to the other person, the other person's, person's face. Um, and he thinks that this is this represents a transcendental relation. And as such, it is our, it's, it's prior to ontology uh, and prior to epistemology. It's prior fills, it's prior in philosophy, period. Right, so ethics becomes first philosophy, and you're going to see him unfolding that thesis in the next couple. It's a little bit today, and especially in the next video, you're going to we're going to see talk about that in a lot of depth. Um, the other thing here is that the meaning of ethics for him ultimately is about inner subjectivity. So um, you could say that inner subjectivity is the is a classic term. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a classic term, but it's a term that actually goes back to the 19th century. Uh, but we saw that, or we see that uh, Husserl used the term quite a bit. I mean, it's the, it's the idea of talking about the way in which we exist with other people in communities, right? So you can talk about, for instance, the subjectivity of an individual. I'm Mark, and I have my own particular experience. You're you, and you have a different experience. But we also have an experience to and with each other. And that represents that there's an intersubjective relation. So we're going to see here that when to talk about uh, my, the, the self and the other, the same and the other, that's the term he's going to use, is ultimately to talk about what inner subjectivity is. Uh, but inner subjectivity is not going to be something about the reduction of the other to just some sort of version of myself. And we'll see that in a minute. So, but ultimately, the meaning of ethics is given in these intersubjective conditions. Um, the other, right, the other person, the, the other individual, right, who I can't fully capsulate and can't fully understand, invokes an irreducible, irreducible relation of infinite responsibility. And ultimately, this is going to be sort of Levinas's understanding, is that when I'm faced with the other, there's a transcendental relationship that gets, that gets um, borne out, such that the other is transcendent to me. That's what it means for them to be other than me, right? But this transcendence is similar and is like the, in, the infinity that Descartes talks about when he talks about um, the concept of infinity and he's talking about the, um, the understanding of God in the meditations on first philosophy. And this infinite relationship I have with another is asymmetrical, right? So here I stand, but here the other stands above me, if you will. Because they're irreducible, I can never really understand them. That means that uh, I enter into a relationship that's asymmetrical, and of course they enter into an asymmetrical relation with me. But this relation ultimately is um, what is the grounds for inner subjectivity. Uh, now, ethics begins, of, of course, that means with our encounter with the other. And here I put down Husserl and inner subjectivity, um, and this really comes out of, you can really see this most prominently in Husserl's Cartesian Meditations, where Emmett Husserl talks about the idea of, well, when I see another person in consciousness, I recognize through what Husserl calls a structural form of empathy, I recognize that they are like me, they are a, a monad, that's Husserl's term, they're a monad that's existing and experienced in the world the way I am, and I therefore see them as similar to myself, and I create a sort of system where I, I mirror their consciousness and my own, and I have a pairing in which my relationship to them is situated. Um, and this is sort of Husserl's understanding, uh, but uh, we're going to see Levinas soundly rejects this entire sort of structure that Husserl gives because that whole structure actually has the opposite asymmetry, right? Uh, when I see the other and I just see them and I assume that they're like me, ultimately what happens is the other gets, re gets reduced to the same. It gets reduced to my understanding, my own subjective understanding. Um, so... Ethics begins with an authentic encounter with the other, not a Husserlian encounter with the other, right? And he's going to describe the encounter we have with the other as a face-to-face -face relation. Um, and the face is going to be important. Now, 
Obviously, he's thinking about the faces we see, but for him, the face-to-face -face relationship ultimately gets constituted in language. And so this transcendental relationship begins in language in the communication and the conversations we have with others. Um, and this means that for, and we'll see this at the end of today's talk um, in section 1a of Levinas's text, that transcendence in metaphysics therefore precedes ontology. Um, because ethics proceeds, and so therefore ethics is first philosophy. Um, so that's going to be kind of what we're going to be taking a look at today. Now, before we get going, and before I pull up his text and we start going through it, I want you to consider the experience that we have when we have a conversation with another person. Think about, for instance, Socratic philosophy, and when Socrates sits down and has a conversation with another person, or think about when you just have a conversation with another person, and I'm talking here about this sort of authentic discourse um, that we see maybe Heidegger talking about, but authentic discourse where we actually hear another person, and we take what they're saying, not in terms of the ready to hand, as it were, but in terms of the present to hand, using Heidegger's vernacular. Um, and think about when we have an authentic conversation with another, um, and we were if we were to try to describe that experience, phenomenologically, you can see that when I'm having a conversation with another person, there's, there's a point at which I have to listen to the other person, and to listen to them is to not to try to force them to be what I think or want them to be, but to allow them to be who they are, to be other than myself. And an authentic conversation is when both I'm doing this and the other person is listening, and where we recognize and we respect the exteriority of the other person. And so as we're going through and we're looking at some of Levinas' uh, writings here in just a moment, I want you to be thinking and uh, thinking back about um, the, the sort of description you might have regarding an authentic conversation with the other. So think that through, and by the end here we'll sort of talk about that a little bit. Okay, like I said earlier, we're going to be jumping in and taking a look at uh, totality infinity. I want to go through his text pretty systematically. Um, and what I've done here is I've gone through and I've highlighted passages that I want to sort of talk about. That I probably, in fact, I know I've highlighted too many things. Um, and so I'm going to be going through here and sort of picking up on some of the key points. It's important to recognize that I don't really have time to go through all the intricacies of his text here um, and all of the arguments, but I'm going to try to touch upon uh, all the stuff that I think is really fundamental and I think really quite interesting. Um, one of the things that's important when you first start reading a book is take a look at the table of contents. Um, I once had a, a graduate school professor tell me how surprised he was that people don't start by reading the table of contents. And so I thought it important here. Now, I've highlighted what we're going to be covering in our video lectures. But you can see the totality is consists of three of, of section, a number of sections. Section one is called the same and the other. And this is the section where uh, Levinas wants us wants to or art, art, art does articulate his conception of the same. And the same is 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 I think we can understand that in terms of my the phenomenology we have of the world. So I have a certain phenomenology and a certain experience of the world. And that's what I mean by the same. It's my experience, right? But the other is outside of that, right? So the outs it's outside of the same. So he uses this distinction between the same and the other, which is really quite important. Uh, we're going to look at metaphysics and transcendence in today's video. Uh, but in the next video, we'll be looking at separation and discourse, truth and justice, and then truth and the absolute. And then and, uh, sort of move here, you can see section two is about interiority and economy. It's about um, my interior life and what it means to live. And, and here, Heidegger, I'm not Heidegger, pardon me, Levinas talks about separation in life, intentionality and in social relationship. Enjoyment plays a key role for Levinas's conception of interiority and enjoyment. So for him to understand my life uh, or if I want to give a description of my interior life, then what I'll see is that my life is given and organized by enjoyment and by and I act accordingly. Um, so enjoyment plays a really important part of his uh, philosophy. He also talks about dwelling. Um, and there's a similar, there is definitely a similar note here with Heidegger. 
Um, but it, it is definitely a different, I think, interesting conception. We'll see in the uh, beginning here, Levinas will talk a little bit about this. And then the world's phenomena. Now, the third lecture that we're going to be looking at is section three, exteriority in the face. And we're going to be looking at uh, sensibility in the face, what it means to have a sensation of another, to recognize that there's another, and then, of course, the ethics in the face. So we'll be looking at that and the ethical relation in time. And we'll be looking at those um, chapters in our third video. And then um, the rest of uh, Totality and Infinity concerns beyond the face. And he talks about love, a phenomenology of eros, fecundity, um, subjectivity in eros, transcend transcendence and fecundity, um, and, and then fraternity in the infinity of time. And then he has a series of conclusions, uh, which are really important. And I may actually talk about some of these uh, if I get a chance to. Uh, which are really worth taking a look at. Um, and that's really sort of the way it's structured. That's what we'll be looking at in our video series here of Totality and Infinity. Now, there's also a, uh, there's also a great introduction uh, by, I believe, John Wilde, which you should take a look at if you have the text. But we're going to be jumping right now to the preface. Um, and it's important here. This is my note. I added this in, so just to keep that separate, that's not actually in the book. Um, the preface really begins as a reaction and in a response to, I think, um, his experience and the experience of thousands of war. One moment, it's raining outside, and so it's getting really dark in here. So I'm going to pause the video for just a moment and see if I can improve the lighting conditions here. Give me just one moment. There we go. My apologies for that. So let's start here with the preface, and it really begins uh, with his response to war. And I'm just going to sort of jump to the different portions I've highlighted and use them as sort of a uh, touchstones to talk about this stuff. So if you have the text, um, you can follow along. Um, and if you are if you don't have the text, you should buy it, and then you can follow along. Um, so um, take a look. Totality of Infinity by Emmanuel Levinas. So it's interesting. He starts off his preface by saying, everyone will readily agree that it's of the highest importance that we know whether or not uh, if we know whether we are, are not duped by morality. Now here's the question of, remember, all of us have an operable sense of morality. We all have a certain conception of what's wrong and what's right. And the question here is, are we being duped by it? Could we be wrong based upon the sorts of morality? All of us, it's very, very important. And of course, consider the, what's happened in war and consider all the things that took place um, right, people in war, both sides of war, typically see themselves as moral agents or moral executors of the war, right? Um, they see it as a moral obligation of sorts. And you can think here, for instance, of the tension now between um, really what you might say is the prevailing world order and ISIS, for instance, um, and uh, or any number of persons who are engaged in warfare, both parties, presumably, right, see themselves as executing a certain sort of moral ethos. Now, here's, but, and so what does that mean exactly? Now, here's some of the things he talks about. The state of war suspends morality um, because war is not only one of the ordeals, the greatest of which morality lives, it render, renders morality um, derisory, um, derisory, right? And so you can see here that the morality is of utmost importance, but war and the permanent possibility of war will actually suspend morality permanently. Um, he actually argues that, he, of course, he's, we know that politics has been described as um, war by other means, and he says politics is opposed to morality as philosophy to naivete, right? Um, so so there's, a, there's an interesting sort of setup here to start off. You can see that Levinas is trying to grapple with um, some of the problems that, that are really quite indicative of his experience in the Second World War. He, go, he goes on to talk about what violence is. He says, but violence does not consist in, let me actually make this bigger. He says, but violence does not consist so much in injuring and annihilating persons as interrupting their continuity, making them play roles in which they no longer recognize themselves making them betray not only commitments, but their own substance, making them carry actions that will destroy every possibility for action, right? War does not manifest exteriority in the other as other. 
it destroys the identity of the same. So it's very sort of interesting. If we make this, if we understand ourselves in terms of this concept of the same, and we understand the other as that which is exterior, right? What he's arguing here is that violence and what violence and war do is they destroy the same, right? They destroy our ability to be who we think we are. Um, and of course, this is anyone who's gone to war um, and experienced war um, knows this, right? Um, people are changed by war. Um, and they, and it's not about, the other is not what's changed here, they are what's changed, right? He says, war is fixed in the concept of totality, which dominates Western philosophy. And you're going to see, of course, the two concepts that he's juxtaposing are in the title. Totality on the one hand, and infinity on the other. Totality is, is ultimately about making something always the same, right? Um, unifying something. This is code for the same. And he's going to ultimately argue that Western philosophy has always moved in the towards the trajectory of totality, right? And even Heidegger's Seinsfrage is an attempt of totality, right? To understand the question of being, which for Heidegger is so critical, since all of us are beings, it is the most totalizing form of philosophy perhaps one could imagine. Right? And of course, war is, if you will, a concrete form to force totality. Right? Literally, I lose myself in the war because I'm forced into the totality of the war. Right? Individuals are reduced to beings, uh, to being bearers of forces that command them unbeknownst to themselves. Right? So individuality is lost in war. Right? The meaning of individuals is in invisible out um, invisible outside of this totality is derived from the totality, right? So in a war, the meaning of my life it is ignored if it's outside of the totality of the war, and it's only derived from the totality um, that the war is forcing into forcing into being in a concrete sense. And here, think about, for instance, um, think about the people who who would have probably lived. Uh, very good moral lives uh, had the Second World War not happened. Think about a person in Germany, for instance, who's conscripted into the not into the Nazi army, right? And think about what their life becomes. The meaning of their individuality gets lost, and it gets reinscribed into this totality. Now, the unicity of each present is incessantly sacrificed to a future appealed to to bring forth its objective meaning, right? So the whole notion of war here is that we sacrifice individuals to make some sort of totalizing um, thing in, come into being, right? And all of our 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 the uh, our present as individuals gets lost into that, right? So you can see here there's a strong sort of reaction here to the war. He even says, for instance, the peace of empires issued from war rests on war. It does not restore to the alienated beings their lost identity. For that, a primordial and original relation with being is needed. Um, so we see here the idea that Levinas is arguing that, listen, p political peace um, is not sufficient. What we ultimately have to do is political peace cannot give us an ethics, right? Because an ethics ultimately is one which is derived from and respects the exteriority of the other, right? And think here about, I mean, just think in a basic terms between the way the Nazis understood and conceived of the Jews, right? There was a loss of respect, right? Um, and this became, of course, a political mobilization technique uh, for the National Socialist. Um, and you can see that there is the that there's the loss of ethics seems to be preceded by a loss in respect of the exteriority of the other. And so by consequence, you can see here that the peace of an empire is not which issues war, rest on war, and that peace of that empire is not ultimately going to give us ethics, right? Um, we have to understand a primordial and original relation, of course, that relation is primarily what he's going to be talking about. Now we see here a sort of moment here where Levinas reveals his, um, I think, his his Jewish theological side, right? When he talks about the, the extraordinary phenomena of prophetic eschatology. Now remember, eschatology, sometimes think about in theology, 
is a question of what happens in the end. Um, and it's, it's, it's the way in which um, in eschatology, in, um, in the Jewish religion, the notion of the Messiah coming, right? Uh, this old notion, right? And so there's the notion of eschatology and the idea that we're organized towards this end. Now, eschatology says in it institutes a relation with being beyond the totality or beyond history and not with being beyond the past and the present. Right? So when we talk about eschatology, we can see there that religious eschatology shows us that there's different ways in which you can have relations that go beyond something that's total, beyond a pure totality. And of course, he's going to argue here that a conception of history tends to be one of totality. Right? When you try to understand everything under the auspices of a single thesis, you've totalized that which is other than you. Right, uh, but eschatology provides a clue for a different way of thinking about these relationships. Right, eschatology is a relationship with the surplus always exterior to the totality. Right, because wherever one is in history, the eschatology transcends it. Right, um, for instance, in Protestant Christianity, we also see a conception of eschatology, the idea that Christ will return. Right, and so no matter what happens in history. That eschatological point is always transcendent to any historical understanding or conception we hold, right? So eschatology gives us a clue to a transcendence beyond totality, right? Um, and that's how I'm understanding his discussion here, right? Um, and ultimately, it goes to the concept of infinity, right? Uh, which is about the transcendence with regard to totality, right? Um, so um, we're going to see infinity plays this really central notion for in um, for Levinas in his philosophy. Uh, now, one of the things we're going to see in his philosophy is also the idea that peace is produced as this uh, aptitude. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me move here. The experience of morality does not proceed from. Well, I guess I got to go back here. The eschatological notion of judgment implies that being have an identity before eternity, right? So, okay, go back to eschatology. There's a final sort of end in history, right? And we have our identity is before this thing that happens in eternity, right? Because uh, eschatology will go on beyond history, right? And uh, peace is produced in this vein. So when we're to talk about peace, peace uh, involves not the identity of a historical totality, but peace is about our relationship with the infinite, right? It does not envision the end of history without being understood as a totality, but institutes a relation with the infinite of being, which exceeds the totality. You can see here, on the one hand, clearly Levinas is very religious in this con his conception here, uh, because he's thinking of, I mean, it's hard not to, for, not to think about um, his theological conceptions of God and the relationship of of God is the infinite here, right? Now, he says the experience of morality does not proceed um, from this vision, it consummates this vision. Ethics is an optics. So this is the first point in the preface here where he just talks about ethics. Um, and the idea here is that our experience of morality uh, doesn't come out of this vision of eschatology, it is consummated with eschat this eschatological notion that we are before the infinite. Um, and ethics is rather a way of viewing things. It's an optics. And, but he says, but it is a vision without image, bereft of the synoptic and totalizing objective, fine virtues of vision, a relation of an intentionality of a wholly different type, which this work seeks to describe. So you can see here is that uh, definitely Levinas is a phenomenologist in this sense. Um, let's keep going here. Uh, now, there's a number of questions that get raised by Levinas, um, and that concerns ultimately the question of our beings and the relationship we have to infinity and what exactly he means here, right? He asks, is relationship with being produced only in representation the natural locus of evidence? Does objectivity whose harshness and universal power is revealed in war provide the unique and primordial form in which being, when it's distinguished from image, dream, and subject of um, abstraction imposes itself on consciousness? Is the apprehension of an object equivalent to the very movement in which the bonds with 
uh, with truth or woven. These questions are the uh, the present work answers in the negative, right? So he answers no to all of these questions. Of peace, there can only be an eschatology. Now, eschatology for him is ultimately about the infinity that's, that comes out of the, um, exteri the exteriority of the other, right? Or is initiated by that exterior exteriority, right? He says this transcendence is expressed by the term infinity, um, it does not lead to the acceptance of a dogmatic content, right? So he's, he, he's anti-dogmatism here, and that's an important thing, right? So his conception here is not going to be that the infinite just tells me what to do, right? Uh, right? The, in, in fin, the infinite is something which is always overflowing and in, in beyond myself, right? Um, and this revelation of infinity is not meant to be dogmatic, Right, uh, whose philosophical rationality cannot be argued for in the in the name of transcendental truth of the identity of infinity. Right, um, <clears throat> going forward, he says, but the relationship with infinity, the idea of the infinite, as described as Descartes calls it, overflows thought in a wholly different sense than does opinion. Opinion vanishes the, like the wind when thought touches it, or is revealed to be already within that thought. So his conception of infinity, he's trying, I think Levinas here is trying to differentiate his conception of infinity um, as different than things like opinion. Um, and it's more in line with Descartes' conception, some, a positive conception of infinity. We'll get that to that here in just a couple moments, right? He says, the relationship with infinity cannot, to be sure, be stated in terms of experience. For infinity overflows the thought that thinks it, right? So infinity ultimately cannot, and of course, ask yourself, what is the infinite? The infinite is that which has no end, but that's not the conception that Levinas is characterizing here. He's trying to think of the infinite in terms of the infinite. Infinity qua infinite. Um, and here, infinity is something that's always overflowing, right? So experience, which is naturally limited, cannot be the way to understand inf infinity. So the relationship I have with the other is not just an analogical relationship that I have based upon my experiences. It's fundamentally, metaphysically, ontologically distinct and different. He says the relationship with infinity will have to be stated in terms other than those of objective experience, but of experience precisely, uh, but if experience precisely means a relation with the absolute other, that is, with uh, what always overflows thought, the relation with infinity accomplishes experience in the fullest sense of the word. So there's an interesting relationship here, is he's arguing that on the one hand, our experience cannot, we can't use experience as an analog for understanding the infinite, but that the infinite does offer for us an experience. Uh, so there's a sort of interesting way, and you can see here why he thinks of it in terms of an eschatological vision. Now, moving forward here, um, Heidegger, not Heidegger, Levinas, I keep saying that, my apologies, right? Um, Levinas talks about the idea that, so what is this book about? Well, this book will present subjectivity as welcoming the other, as hospitality, right? So it's not a, the idea that the, the other is something to be conquered, right? That's the notion of totalization. That's the conception of war he's arguing against. Rather, he wants to argue that what totality and infinity is about is it's about the welcoming of the other. And it's about um, 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 seizing that responsibility I have to the other, a hospitality, right? And in the idea of infinity is consummated. So infinity can be consummated in this activity of responsibility I have with the other. He also continues, hence intentionality, Right, and think here of what we've discussed regarding Husserl in particular. Hence, intentionality, where thought remains in adequation with an idea, does not define consciousness as its fundamental level. All knowing qua intentionality already presupposes the idea of the in, of infinity, which is preeminently non-adequation. Right. And so idea here is, remember, for Husserl, when I have intentionality, I have an intentional uh, object, which I grasp uh, as a form of adequation in my mind, right? Uh, 
um, and then I can be conscious of it. And Husserl sets out the structure of experience uh, based upon intentionality and his com the comportments we have in intentionality, the modes of intentionality, where we talk about states of mind and all this sorts of stuff. Um, and Heidegger also talks about states of mind said, as well, right? But here, what Levinas is arguing is that, guess what? This notion that he's trying to describe with infinity is ultimately more fundamental. It's fundamental to consciousness itself. Just to be aware means to, to presuppose an idea of infinity, um, which is going to be very interesting and provocative. I think um, you're going to be aroused by by his ideas here, right? He continues, to, to contain more than one's capacity is to shatter at every moment the framework of a content that is thought, to cross the barriers of imminence, uh, but without this descent into being reduces itself anew to a concept of descent. Philosophers have sought to express with the concept of act, this descent into the real, uh, which the concept of thought interpreted as a pure knowing the world, right? So the notion of act involves a violence essentially, the violence of transivity, right? Lacking in the transcendence of thought, right? And so here we see that Levinas is differentiating ultimately a phenomenology of infinity um, from a more classic philosophical conception. And it shatters our conceptions and our frameworks for thought. The infinite overflows, as it were. Um, you can see in many ways I think that Levinas is the phenomenological thinker of infinity in the way in which Georg Cantor is the mathemati mathematical thinker of infinity. Uh, it's sort of a very interesting sort of relation here, or we're thinking about, right? Um, he argues what in action breaks forth as essential violence is the surplus of being over the thought that claims to contain it, the marvel of the idea of infinity. So the idea of infinity which is not in its turn a representation of infinity, is the common source of activity in theory, right? So he's basically saying that there's this a priori fundamental relationship we have with infinity. It is necessary for consciousness. It's necessary part of ethics. Um, and it's necessary for understanding whether or not we're duped by morality and how we can understand and, and, um, and how we can combat the violence and the war of our age. Infinity for him is this central philosophical concept, right? He goes on, consciousness this then does not consist in equaling being with representation, right? Not just having an idea in my mind, right? Intending to the full light in which um, this adequation is to be sought, but rather in an overflowing this play of lights, this phenomenology and in accomplishing events whose signification does not lie in disclosing, right? So here, consciousness, the relationship of consciousness and infinity is not one of disclosure, right? Um, and notice how frequently we were reading Heidegger, how frequently Heidegger dis uses the term disclosure or uses the notion of disclosing, right? Because um, Heidegger wants to understand how being gets disclosed through Dasein, right? Um, you can see here that the relationship of infinity has to be very different. Because infinity cannot be grasped as such, because it always goes beyond what we can conceive of, since we're finite beings, right? That means that the ph a phenomenology of consciousness based upon infinity isn't, isn't um, structurally framed as a type of Heideggerian disclosure, right? And you can see here he mentions Heidegger even. Um, in, in immediately right there, right? He says, philosophy does indeed discover the signification of these events, but they are produced without discovery or truth being their destiny. No prior disclosure illuminates the production of these essentially nocturnal events, right? Ultimately, here's, and this is why I've highlighted this section, he says, the welcoming of the face, because the face is how the other how this sort of infinite transcendental relation gets initiated, the welcoming of the face and the work of justice, right, which condition the birth of truth itself, are not interpretable in terms of disclosure, right? And notice here that when I see another person in an authentic conversation and I'm talking to someone and listening to them, right, it's not as if they disclose who they are, right? They don't disclose it, they reveal it, perhaps, and there are things that get disclosed, 
but who they are in their otherness does not get disclosed, right? Phenomenology is a method for philosophy, but phenomenology, um, the comprehension affected through a bringing to light, does not constitute the ultimate event of being itself. The relation between the same and the other is not always reducible to knowledge of the other by the same, right? So here he's saying there's a limit to phenomenology itself philosophically. Phenomenology is a method that is trying to understand our experience of others and our experience in the world, right? By taking a very close scientific deliberative evaluation and critique of our experience, right? But ultimately the relation that the other and the same have is something that goes beyond knowledge, right? Um, and so in that sense, it, there's, a, there's a sort of limitation here. And you can see him arguing here against this notion of disclosure that's indicative of the Heideggerian conception. He says, intentional analysis is the search for the concrete. This is a comment about phenomenology. Notions held under the direct gaze of the other that define them are nevertheless, unbeknown to this naive thought, revealed to be implanted in horizons unsuspected by this thought. These horizons endow them with meaning, such is the essential teaching of Husserl, right? So he's very well of Husserl and what Husserl's view is. But the problem is, for Husserl, knowledge depends upon horizons of understanding. But we're going to see that it's not horizons which are at bottom, um, which are fundamental to consider here. It's ultimately the relationship we have with the other, and that relationship is tantamount to an infinity to relationship of infinity, right? And that's something that Husserl's intentional analysis is not going to get us towards. It's not going to fully get us there, right? So he says the aspiration to radical exteriority, thus called metaphysical, the respect for this metaphysical exteriority, which above we must let be, constitutes truth, right? So radical exteriority is what he says is truth. That's what constitutes truth. Right? So you can see here in this preface, Levinas is laying out a really core number of ideas. Right? Um, and he's of course going to show that ethical relations are to lead transcendence to this term. This is because the essential, the essential of ethics is in its transcendent intention. And because not every transcendent intention has the noesis no, uh, noema structure. And of course, if you've been watching the video lectures, you'll remember that the noesis noema is a core concept in the Husserlian phenomenological framework, but ethics goes beyond that. Ethics, um, and there's something, it's a transcendental intention as it were, right? Husserlian phenomenology has made possible this passage from ethics to metaphysical exteriority. So we are in a Husserlian framework here, though it goes beyond Husserl, right? And philosophical re research, in any case, does not answer questions like an interview with an oracle or wisdom. I think I just highlighted that because I liked it. It's just a, a great quote. Um, okay, and then finally here in the preface, uh, Levinas says, the word by way of preface which seeks to break through the screen stretched between the author and the reader by the book itself does not give itself out as a word of honor, but it belongs to the very essence of language which consists in continually undoing its phrase by the foreword or the exegesis in unsaying the said and attempting to restate without ceremonies what has already been ill understood in the inevitable ceremonial in which the said delights. So, by the way, can you not know, see here that he is a beautiful writer? Um, and you can see here that what he's meant to do with this preface is essentially give way to some of these ideas um, just in, ma in a manner of gesture. So we're already an hour in, so I'm going to stop here. Um, this is the end of part one. Part two will conclude um, um, the video section um, for Totality and Infinity, section 1A. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope that this, this, this way I've been doing the videos here by going through the text more systematically is instructive and provocative and helpful. Thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you guys online.